Okay, well, thank you for coming. This is our first math honors presentation for people of the class of 2016, and Mr. Grubel will speak on critical groups for Cayley graphs of bent functions. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm first class Grubel, and I will be presenting on critical groups for Cayley graphs of bent functions. I apologize if I make any mistakes with the clicker. I'm new to it. Um, so here's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, of note here is that the we're going to suppose that f of zero is equal to zero for all of these bend functions that we'll be working with, uh, which is um, which is an okay assumption to make because for all of these functions, if f of zero is not equal to zero, you simply add a constant um, to make sure that f of zero is equal to zero, and the function is still bent, so it doesn't uh, detract anything from the math of it. So we're going to study the critical group of bent functions in the Pierre case. Um, so moving into some definitions and background, uh, here we're going to denote that the support of f is equal to all of is the, the set of all vectors in v sub m such that f of v is not equal to zero. Um, and also note that the number of non-zero coordinates of the vector representation of f is the size of the support of f. So here, uh, a pretty big function that we used throughout my research was the walsh hadamard transform of a function. Um, it's important because it measures how nonlinear a function is and is given by this equation here. Uh, I also had it written over here as equation three because I'll be using it later in the presentation. Um, and then it's mainly important because to define a function as being bent, we say that a function is bent if the size of the Walsh transform, the Walsh Hadamard transform, is equal to p to the n over 2. Uh, so now moving into some background uh, on graph theory. A, um, I worked a lot with connected, undirected graphs. Uh, they were also strongly regular. Uh, they were undirected because all the bent functions that I worked with uh, were even. And the, so in the Boolean case, these, these graphs are strongly regular because the functions are bent. In the Pieri case, uh, the exact connection between a function being bent and the graph being strongly regular is not uh, completely known at this time. When you talk about p area, do you allow p equal to 2, or is that some whole separate thing? It did, I do allow p equal to 2. Um, we just call that the, the Boolean case. And I was working specifically with p equal to 3. But so when you say, say a function is even, if it's in, in the uh, binary case, is, is any function even, or, or uh, no functions are even, or is there something strange in there? Um, I know there is something strange about it. I just can't. We we talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the semester. I'm not exactly sure what the the um, anomaly was there. Well, I guess negative one is equal to one, so probably everything's equal. Okay. Yes. Um. So next, more definitions and background. Um, the Cayley graph of a function is defined here, and then. The big thing is that it's edge weighted. In the Boolean case, the Cayley graph doesn't need to be edge weighted, but for my research, this actually proves to be um, something that's really key uh, that I'll go over later. And the weight uh, for the edges is just edge uv has the weight f of u minus v. So, here, we're moving into a little bit more towards what I was studying. Um, it's more just background on graph theory. Uh, so we're talking about a vertex being incident to an edge, as well as the incidence matrix of a graph. Um, and these are useful because for the Laplacian of the graph, uh, the Laplacian is an n by n matrix such that L equals B, B transpose. Um, and this is actually the analog of the Laplacian for partial differential equations. And then 
really what we're concerned with is not so much Laplacian as the reduced Laplacian, uh, which is the matrix obtained by removing the first row and first column of the Laplacian. We denote it with L star. Um, it's important to use this one instead of the Laplacian because it's invertible, uh, so that we can use it to get the um, critical group of the graph, which is given by K of gamma. We denote the critical group K of gamma uh, equals Z to the size of the vertex set minus one modulo the image of the reduced Laplacian. So I started my research by going through a paper by Dino Lorenzini where he studies critical groups um, and in the Boolean case. So one of his propositions was something I focused on where essentially what he did was he took the eigenvalues, the non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian and noted that when they're the product of all the non-zero eigenvalues is equal to the size of the critical group of the graph times P to the M. Um, so for our case, I kind of rewrote it uh, to look a little better. Uh, and it's also my equation one up here on the board because I'll be referring to it later. Uh, the size of the critical group is equal to the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian times, um, or to the, the multiplicity of that eigenvalue times the third eigenvalue to the multiplicity of that eigenvalue times P to the negative M. Uh, we omit the first eigenvalue because for all of these um, examples, the first eigenvalue is just equal to one, so there's no need to write it in there. Uh, I also studied this proposition by Lorenzini, which really what we focused on was the third item, that the critical group contains a subgroup isomorphic to Z mod lambda sub I of L Z to the multiplicity of lambda sub i of L minus one, uh, which is contained in two up here on the board, because I'll also be using that later as well. Um, so now I'm gonna move into really what I researched a lot was these even bent functions. Uh, I took these from a paper by Solarier et al. He was an honor student here a few years back. Um, and what he did was he found the eight, that there are 18 bent functions in the case of GF3 squared into GF3 um, that are even and have f of zero equal to zero. So they satisfy, these bent functions satisfy all of our assumptions. Um, and that's kind of what I was studying. So each one of the functions is gonna have this table here um, that gives the all the points of GF3 squared, then the um, value of the function, the bent function at that point, as well as the Walsh transform of that function at that point, um, where we use the note, I use the notation, uh, this kind of like four, 441 is really A, B, C, um, where A, B, and C are all non negative integers that sum to nine. Uh, it was just for notation's sake, so really what they come from is this equation here on the board, um, which is the equation for the Walsh transform of a function. It's just that when you sum over all these things, you end up with A zeta squared, B zeta uh, plus C, and like I said, it's, it's just kind of a notation thing to save space in the presentation so you're not looking at just huge long equations. Um, so here we're going to note that there are four occurrences of 414, four occurrences of 144, and one occurrence of 441, which as we kind of went through, as I kind of went through all the examples, it kind of started popping up that there's, so there's 441, and there's 441 within this, the Walsh transform, um, which was something that I found interesting and I noticed that it actually ends up <coughs> for all of these examples. Um, so more on B1, uh, the Cayley graph of B1, we call gamma sub one, has nine vertices, and the edge weight is B sub one of x zero minus x one on that edge. Um, 
The unweighted version of gamma sub 1 is the complete graph on nine vertices. Um, just kind of interesting to note that the difference between the unweighted version and the weighted version. Um, here we move into the adjacency matrix for B1. Uh, it's given by, so for each IJ entry in this matrix, um, the entry is given by the weight of the edge connecting vertex I with vertex J, um, which would be zero on the diagonal because, you know, one one is not, does not have an edge. There's no... I'm assuming this graphic over here is of the bunch you're talking about right now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it says pink is twos and blue is the one? Yes, sir. So that's the Cayley graph for uh, gamma of B sub 8, actually. Um, not necessarily B sub 1, but that, that's exactly what the graph would look like um, for B sub 8. <clears throat> so then from the adjacency matrix, uh, you can get the corresponding Lapl Laplacian matrix, which if you look, these entries here are all just the negative of the entries here. Uh, the difference is that on the diagonal, you have the what ends up being the row sum for the rows of the adjacency matrix. So if you look, you have one plus one plus one plus two plus two plus one plus two plus two. That all adds up to twelve, which is the diagonal entries for the Laplacian. Um, so we define the Laplacian as BB transpose earlier, but you can also say that it's kind of a matrix delta that has these twelves on the diagonal minus the adjacency matrix. And then, so what we really care about is the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, uh, which here are lambda 1 equals 0, lambda 2 equals 12, lambda 3 equals 15. Um, and they have respective multiplicities 1, 4, and 4. Again, uh, 1, 4, and 4 popping up as they did in the Walsh transform. Uh, the critical group, we used SAGE to compute. It was uh, K of gamma sub 1 is equal to Z mod 60Z squared cross Z mod 180Z squared. Um, and then, so we wanted to verify that equation 1 actually does hold, which is the equation we got from Lorenzini. And in fact, it does. Um, the size of the critical group is 60 squared 180 squared, which is equal to uh, lambda 2, 12, to its multiplicity 4 times lambda 3, 15 to its multiplicity 4 times p to the negative m, which would be 3 to the negative 2. Excuse me, why did the non-zero eigenvalue of this is possibly next to the positive? Um, I mean, you're certainly saying that because you're saying it's equal to the order of this group. Right. Oh, sorry, I was not like you uh, I'm actually not completely sure why they, they have to be positive. Um, so here we have another, the second uh, function that we looked at from Slurry et al. is uh, B2. And again, we have the same table, except this time the Entries for the Walsh transform are two two fives. Um, again, we had this weird thing happen where there was five occurrences of two two five, two occurrences of two five two, and two occurrences of five two two, um, which ends up playing out throughout all the examples, like I was saying. So, again, we compute the adjacency matrix, the edge weighted adjacency matrix, uh, which gives us the Laplacian matrix. And then what we actually care about is the eigenvalues, again, um, so that we can check this equation one over here, um, where it does in fact hold for this k, the size of the critical group for B, B2, which gives gamma 2, 9 squared, 54 squared is the size, which is equal to the, um, the eigenvalue 3 squared, 6 squared, 9 to the 4th, and then 3 to the negative 2. Um, so we went through this for all of these uh, different functions. I included 
B1 through B18 in the PowerPoint. I'm actually going to skip ahead uh, to a summary of them in the interest of time because uh, it's just a lot to go through. Um, but again, you can see you're, you're getting pretty much the same 225s. Um, and this is actually B8, which is the, the graph over here. Uh, you get the same Laplacian, or the, I'm, I'm sorry, the same, yeah, the same Laplacian eigenvalues with multiplicities. Um, and if I get to the summary, 16, 17, 18. So the summary would be that when we look th through all this, uh, there's really essentially two classes of bent functions from GF3 squared into GF3. Um, and class one had, the, had the sa all the same eigenvalues, lambda one equals zero, lambda two equals 12, lambda three equals 15. The critical group was exactly the same for all of these, and the functions uh, that were in this class were B1, B12, B13, B17, and B18. Uh, the other class was defined, essentially, had all the same eigenvalues as B2 um, that we went over. It's got four eigenvalues and a critical group of Z mod 9Z squared cross Z mod 54Z squared. Um, Functions in this class are B, as you can see, B2, B3, all the way up to B11, and then 14, 15, and 16. Um, we just thought it was interesting. So that was really the biggest result from looking at all these functions was that they classified into two different classes, uh, which brought us to the conjecture that really the critical group of the Cayley graph of a bent function F only depends on the size of the support because it was true in this specific case um, where p equals two, p equals three, and n equals two. Uh, so my conjecture is that it holds true always. Um, and then we moved into some other questions, like I was uh, alluding to before, that came from the calculations. So if you look at the vector representation of the Walsh transform this way, uh, where the n, j, k's are given by this, which is essentially just the a, b, c notation that I was using in the table, um, a lot of interesting questions came out of it. So is the multiset s sub f given uh, here, is it independent of all the k's? Um, also, does it only depend on really the type or this, uh, what's known as the signature of f uh, when f is bent? And then for each permutation of S sub F uh, is the number of times it kind of occurs within the, um, the Walsh transform. Is it actually a member of this set here? Uh, so that's kind of what I was saying with like the tables where it was 144 or 414 or 441. Each one of those things occurred either four times or four times or one time. Um, so just kind of some interesting questions that came out of my research that could be um, looked into in the future. And that concludes my presentation. Plan R this weekend, so beautiful. Okay.